I just want to show you these scriptures. I've got to answer that question. So how does God expect me to live now that I'm joined in this relationship with him? See why I had to answer all that stuff first before I talk about how does he expect me to live? Because we're not living to get saved. We're not living right to stay saved. That's a good question. Here are seven of many things God expects you and me to do. He expects us to live trusting him in our hearts that he has done everything that needs to be done in order for you to get saved and remain secure. What does God expect me to do? He expects me to live trusting in my heart that he has done everything, past tense. He has done everything that needs to be done in order for me to get saved and in order for me to stay saved. He's done it. Got to tell yourself that. I choose to live as if though God, and not if though, because he has done it. He's done it all. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, that's why I love showing you the scripture so you know it's not, it's not just Pastor Chris' opinion. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Isn't that a key phrase? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Titus, third chapter, fifth verse says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration literally means a new life. Wow. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Oh, that's a profound word there. He has perfected forever. <laughs> perfected literally means to make them complete. When you see this word in the New Testament, the, it's not talking about flawless performance. It's always talking about two things, making something whole and complete or something mature when you see that word. And so many people take this word and they apply 21st century English definitions to these Old Testament words and say, see, God expects you to be perfect. His word says, be ye perfect as I am perfect. Well, actually, I got to say it now, I got to explain it since I threw that out there. You look in the context in which that was spoken, Jesus had just said, love your enemies. Pray for those <laughs> that, that despitefully use you. Do good to the folks that hate you. Then in that context, he says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So what is he talking about? The word perfect means also means to do it unconditionally. So the same, so I'm telling you to love your enemies, do good to those who don't treat you right, pray for them, be perfect the same way the Heavenly Father is perfect. God loved us and all our imperfections. So he's saying be like the same way God loves us perfectly. He doesn't make, he didn't put conditions on his love, unconditional love. So be like that. That's what that scripture means. Wow. Aren't you glad to get all the religious stuff taken out of it? You mean I don't have that scripture doesn't mean try to be perfect like God is perfect. Well, from the perfect perfection, from the standpoint of loving people without making them love you first. Give them perfect love, mature love, unconditional love, complete love. Don't hold nothing back. Just the opposite of what you've experienced all your life here in Harrisburg. Well, if you do such and such, then I'll do such and such. No, he said, love him. Wow. One offering. One offering. Jesus dying on the cross. He perfected. Got to see this. Past tense. Read these words. He has perfected or completed forever those who are being sanctified. And then there's that word, being sanctified. So you see the concept of both things that I said, what we talked about today, has perfected, the work is done for those who are being sanctified, still in the process. 
Aren't you glad when you see it in scripture? It's, thank you, Lord. Second, live to please Christ. John 8, 29 says, and he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, but I always do those things that please him. So be just like Christ. Live to please Christ the same way Christ said, I live to please my father. You mean that's what I'm supposed to be doing? That, I'm just living to please the Lord. Please him not for the sake of my salvation, but for the sake of his purpose and his will. One of the main things I want you to hear today is that once you and I get saved, once you commit your heart to the Lord, you are no longer in the position of somebody that's trying to get saved, trying to attain heaven. Heaven is no longer your goal. It's your destination. Because you'll find this in many people's lives, not just church, but even folks that don't even go to church. They're trying to live right or live good enough to make it to heaven. So what's the difference with you right now? You're no longer living just trying to make it to heaven. Now you're just living your life to please God. I'm just living to please him. It's whatever he wants to do through me, I'm living for that purpose. We live our lives to the praise of his glory. I want his glo him to be glorified. And that's why he will assign you and me a purpose. He'll give you and I an assignment. He does. And there are assignments that he gives us every day. I believe that God gives us daily assignments, weekly assignments. Some, most of them we're not even aware of. Monthly assignments, annual assignments. In our role, some of the things that I know that are still in my heart to see happen here in Urban Life Church, uh, all of you, especially all of the young people, younger people, I say younger people here in the room, there are things that God's still uh, showing you about your future and where you're headed. There's an ultimate purpose he wants to bring through you and he's going to do through you. But it's not just what he's going to do down the road. There are things he's working through you right now. Do you know that you are right now touching somebody's life as you are pleasing God? Somebody's watching you. Somebody's being encouraged, encouraged by you. There are people who have wanted to quit, wanted to stop, but they watched you or you said something or you did something. Didn't even know that you were, God was using you to bring his life and healing through you. In fact, I believe that most of the things that uh, God is doing through us, and this is very important when I say live to please Christ, because sometimes we'll try to figure out what am I doing to please God. And so I'm not going to throw that heavy pressure upon you because I know that living to please him is really comes down to this. Lord, I'm just going to do what you're telling me to do today. That's really what it comes down to. Lord, I'm just going to do what you're telling me to do today. Tomorrow's not promise. This is important. That way you won't be frustrated about whatever you don't feel like you're not accomplishing yet. Lord, I just live to please you today. I'm going to do what you're telling me to do today. Sometimes what God will tell you to do ain't even nothing deep and spiritual. He'll just say stuff like, uh, like telling me, just take your family out to dinner. Just have the little thought. Take the family out to dinner. Well, that's not deep and spiritual. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. He will. He'll do that kind of stuff. He'll just say, take your daughter skating. Just, just go. Go have fun with your daughter. Why? Because there's bonding, there's, there's memories that you're making that's all a part of forming, of forming in her understanding how much she's loved so that there's a security that's in her the rest of her life. And you'd be like, all I did was took my daughter skating. And I'm like, no, you don't know. I, that was an idea that I put up on you because of something I'm communicating to her. Woo! You be thinking, that ain't deep and spiritual. Yeah. Just do what he's telling you to do today. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, having these promises, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the f flesh and spirit, perfecting, there's that word in the present tense, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's the reason why. 
we're perfecting. Oh, there's that sanctification part. I'm living to please him. So all of the stuff that I'm still struggling with, that I'm still dealing with, Lord, you're perfecting holiness. I'm putting it away. In the times that I'm not successful in putting it away, Lord, I still know you're not leaving me. But that's part of living to please him. I live to please him. Number three, put Christ and his desires and commands first. Matthew 6, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. Colossians 1, 16 through 18 says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. That's a profound reality. <laughs> All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So when you see what well, the description of, of, uh, of Christ, he's everything. He's first. He's number one. He's first. He's last. He's, he's it. He's everything. <laughs> so that I put, Lord, you're first because you, you really are. Whether I accept that you are or not, you really are. And, but it comes, come, becomes a little bit easier in life. I don't say, I'm not saying life is easy, but it becomes a little bit easier when we just go ahead and just acknowledge him. Lord, you come first. I live by your commands. Number four, God expects you and me to read and study and obey the word of God. Matthew 4, 4 says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Many of us are familiar with this scripture, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17 says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them. And that from childhood, this was written to Timothy, but he, uh, saying these, this is how he grew up and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus so it, it applies to us you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise wise for salvation what does that mean to have the proper understanding which I'm giving to you t today a proper understanding of salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So continue in the things you've learned. Continue in this. Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in, righteous, in righteousness, that the man of God, which includes all the ladies, <laughs> may be complete. There's that word. I could easily put the word mature or the word perfect in that passage that we may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work that's how God expects us to live according to the word of God that's why you hear me saying that so much that's why you keep hearing me say that so much get in your word get in your word get in your word get in your word it's not going to be by having some type of special experience or not even just, and God will give us special dynamic moments in, our, in his presence. We'll have wonderful worship times together. God will move by his spirit. I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming for us. We're going to have major breakthroughs, but God doesn't want us just to live just from one great powerful service to the next. He wants us to live here, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's where he wants us. He wants you to continue in the things which you have learned. Rehearse it. Go over and over it again. Walk through it. Feed on it. <laughs> and then live it. Actually intentionally. Be deliberately. Do be deliberate about it. Uh, and so I would encourage everyone, you know, set aside time for the word of God. Really, really. You have to be intentional about that. No, you won't, won't always, you, won't, you know, I can't say that you can, you know, take an hour every day and all that kind of stuff. But really, take the time. Buy a devotional. Buy a good devotional. That are, and there's so much stuff that's available online now where they at least give you one scripture and an explanation to get you started through the day. 
extremely important. The word of God is so potent, it's like taking a little tiny energy pill. <laughs> they talk about that five hour energy drink. That's the word of God, man. It'll take you through the whole day. You'd be like, tiny little bit, I'm good. <laughs> it really is that powerful. How many of you have done that? You've read a devotional just at the start of the day and it just carried you all day long. And of course you ask yourself, why don't I do this more often? How come I don't read this thing every day? But that's part of even our sanctification, just more and more. Get in there and do it. Grow. This is the first scripture I learned when I gave my heart to the Lord at four years old. My mom took me to this passage of scripture and read it. I couldn't read them, so she had to read it for me. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. What does God expect you to do, you and me to do? To grow. And God knows growth takes a, it's a process. You can't be 20 years old at one. I'm looking at little AJ running in and out. And he's not 21. <laughs> Although she's like, I wish he was 21. <laughs> and sometimes we put those kind of expectations on young believers. Somebody just been walking with the Lord two or three years and we put these expectations on them as if though they're 15 or 20 years old in the Lord. Even the ones who are 15 and 20 years old in the Lord haven't shown much maturity in some cases. He wants us to grow. He really does. Spend time in prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. He said, how in the world can I pray without ceasing? You know what you talk to yourself anyway. Doesn't mean you're going to be on your knees and praying all the time. No, but just really allow the Holy Spirit to make this alive to you. That while I'm thinking, to just go ahead and talk to the Lord. Instead of just thinking to myself and worrying, just go ahead and say it to God. You find I'm, I'm praying all day long. Yeah, because it's, if I've discovered that it's far better than just learning, sitting there talking to myself all day long. Because I'll talk myself out of stuff that I should be doing, talk myself into doing stuff that I should not be doing. <laughs> and so we just talk to the Lord. Just talk to him. You know, when stuff is going crazy at work or it's just a regular day at work, Lord, what? I'm, I'm sure you're doing this. I'm like, God, how am I supposed to do this? What do I need to do? God helped me a few months back. They gave me this huge project at work, and it was something that I had never really knew how to do. Um, and I was like, I kind of sat there for a second like, God, okay, how am I going to do this? God said, Be clear as day, Google it. <laughs> He'd be like, you mean he didn't just drop the answer on you? No, God said, Google it. And I Googled it, and there was all the detailed explanation of what I was trying to do. And I did it, and folks was like, they was all impressed with me that I knew how to do. And I knew the truth. God, told you, God said, Google it. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. Spend time in prayer. But aside from that, just the quick moments that we have in prayer, actually set aside a time of concentrated intentional prayer very important very important you'll find that uh it may be a little bit difficult at first mind wandering and daydreaming i've fallen asleep many times woke back up and tried to continue again <laughs> but even that listen to me guys this may sound really weird but even that god has proven to me that he accepts that the times I've just fallen asleep. Because you know what? You're not just falling asleep. I'm falling asleep in his presence. So get rid of that guilt. I keep falling asleep every time. Fall, it's far better to fall asleep in his presence than to fall asleep on a movie. Because the movie's still playing, and even though you're asleep, that stuff is still coming into your spirit. I mean, if you had nightmares and stuff when you fell asleep on a movie. Why? Because that stuff is, your spirit don't go to sleep. It's still receiving. 
And I'm like, if that can happen in a movie, then how much more? Even if you fall asleep in the presence of the Lord. There's so much peace. Wasn't that the best sleep? <laughs> Think about it. Wasn't that the best sleep when you fell asleep praying? <laughs> Oh, thank you, Lord. But don't feel guilty about it is my point. It's about spending time with him. Thank you, Lord. Finally, tell others what God has done for you, what God will do for them. Never be ashamed, and that's the point. Never be ashamed of your relationship with God. Never be ashamed. People ask you, and it does come up. It does come up about your success or why you do what you do. Don't just say, I go to Urban Life Church. Just, you know, this is God. God help me. He gets all the credit for, for what's happening in my life. Tell him. That comes from John 4, four or the story of the Samaritan woman. Many of you are familiar with that story of how Jesus sat down at the well and talked with this lady who had a very, very difficult history. She had been married five times and was living with a guy. Uh, historians say, some of them say that she was, you know, kind of had a reputation, was, and part of the reason why she was even coming to the well at that time of day was so that she could do this when nobody else was around. But after the Lord spoke into her life, as God, as Jesus did, as he spoke into her life, she was so excited, she ran back to the town and told everybody, come See the man who told me everything I ever did. <laughs> she was so excited and so changed by what he had done. So don't be ashamed of what God has done in you. Uh, tell others what God's done for you. You don't have to get into religious debates. I would encourage you there. If people want to fight about religious beliefs and doctrines and heaven and hell and all that, you know what? You can just tell people what he's done for you. Because people can argue with your doctrine, but they can't argue with your testimony. Nobody can argue with your testimony. I know what he did for me. Thank you, Lord. And so that's all of them, all seven. Assured and For you to be assured and secured in and to know how he wants you and I to live. Uh, now that we've done, now that we've accepted him. I won't go into all of this today. I knew I wasn't going to get that far. <laughs> um, bless the Lord. Lord, we just thank you for this word. Thank you for this understanding that has come, greater understanding that has come to us today about your commitment to us, the price that was paid for us, and about how you expect us to live. Lord, we thank you that we are empowered to live this way. And it is our honor and our privilege, Lord. It really is our honor. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the freedom that has come. I sense that chains have been broken, chains of religion and bondage and, and um, various teachings have just been shattered and broken off of us today. Thank you, Lord. I just sense your peace, Lord. You just receive that right where you are. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just receive your peace. I receive this assurance. Thank you, Lord. Don't be afraid of the freedom. Don't be afraid of the freedom. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. The story goes that one of the concentration camps in, second, in, this, in World War II, when the war was over, these people, many of the people had been so abused that uh, even when uh, the prison guards left they abandoned this concentration camp. I don't remember which one it was in World War II where they were holding uh, Jewish people in various ethnic groups. Um, even after the, the prison guards were gone, the people still stayed in the camp for weeks. They could have just walked out at any time. But because of the psychological damage, emotional damage, all the stuff that happened to them being in that camp, even with no guards around, they still stayed. And so that's why I'm making this statement. Don't be afraid of the freedom. 
We've had so much religious bondage and uh, kind of like prison guards, you know, elders and mothers and missionaries and y'all know who all the different people are in church who are always checking you as soon as you walk in the door, making sure that your, your dress is the right length and your makeup is in and the guys got on suits and, you know, you'll see them throughout the week and you're hoping that they don't catch you doing something wrong. Those are the prison guards just <laughs> ready to... <laughs> Prison guards, snipers, ready to get you at any moment. And so we're afraid of the freedom because one of the things that they were afraid of is those guards are out there in the woods somewhere, that even if we walk out of this prison, they're out there somewhere, these soldiers, and they're still going to kill us. So I'm saying to you, don't be afraid of the freedom. There, is, there really is this much freedom in Christ that I can just live my life for his purpose and don't let no, no stigmas, none of the mistakes of the past, none of the stuff of the past, don't let it stop you. Don't let it stop you what people are going to think about you moving and living your life so boldly and free. So I know that those are real pressures and those are real concerns. Because you can feel it when people got something against you because they still view you the way you used to be. And do you know sometimes the way you used to be could be just last week? Because freedom comes to us so quickly and in so, such tremendous dimensions that you are not the same person right now. I declare to you this right now. You're not the same person now that you were when you walked in because so much freedom has just come. More understanding has come. But when you walk out these doors, everybody from family members to friends will still treat you in light of who you were before you came in here today. So it's kind of like, oh, I Kind of feels kind of awkward to walk out with all this freedom, <laughs> and that because then you get with that kind of gives gives that feeling of who you think you are. But it's not who I think I am; it's who He said I am. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Just say that I'm free indeed. I can be who God created me to be. I'm not the man or the woman that made those decisions. I'm not that person anymore. I'm not the person who wallows in the bad decision anymore. I used to, but that ain't me no more. I'm not the one who beats myself over the head anymore about the bad decision. That ain't me no more. I used to, I used to have the pity party and I used to sit and talk with other people who we all talk like that, but I'm free. I'm free. Thank you, Lord God. I'm no longer striving to be saved. I know that they, it's going to feel awkward because some of you, you're around people who they talk like that all the time. You say, how you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? I'm just holding on. And they'll ask you how you doing. And you're supposed to respond the same and say, I'm holding on to No, I ain't just holding on. And you don't have to have an attitude about it, but say, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And you'll get the look. Notice I ain't tell you to give him no spirit, deep spiritual answer. I didn't say, well, I'm blessed by the Lord and highly favored. I didn't say, say all that, but just say, I'm doing great. And watch the look you get. <laughs> doing, because you were supposed to be pitiful like them. I'm, I'm struggling and I'm barely making it. And even if they don't say it all that, you know, you ask people how they're doing it. Well, I'm okay. Y'all, you know how life is. I'm hanging in there. That's the big one. I'm hanging in there. And so it's okay for you to say, I'm doing great. Everything ain't like it's supposed to be. Everything ain't like I want it to be. But I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. What kind of pills did you take today? <laughs> I just found out who I am. That's all. That's all it is. I just found out who I am. I found out that you don't have to get into all of that, but you, but you know. I found out that I'm no longer living under the penalty of sin. I found out that God has taken me through the process of sanctification. I found out that I can live to please him. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I found out that he don't care if, even if I fall asleep while I'm praying. <laughs> I found out that I got a daddy who picks me up. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to cry in my crib all night long waiting for somebody to come pick me up. That daddy hears my cry. And he picks me up. I found out that he understands me. I found out that what I was missing in my life, I never had no father to pat me on the back and say, it's okay, you're doing good. I found out I have a heavenly father 
he does that for me now. He tells me I'm okay. I'm doing good. He says, I'm proud of you, daughter. I'm proud of you, son. Come on, take some more steps. Come on. Remember when you were teaching your kids how to walk? It was shaking and holding on to stuff. And even if you, they fell down, what did you do? You was like, yay! Why? Because you were so glad for the steps that they did take. That it didn't even concern you, the fact that they fell. You were so glad they tried. But please don't tell me my father ain't like that. That he don't just, he's not rejoicing because, Lord, I just tried. I tried to obey you. I tried to please you. I didn't get it all right, but I tried. And that's what daddy's looking at. You hear me, John? Daddy's looking at it. He's saying, John, you took two or three steps, and I know you fell down, and I know you went back to doing some of the stuff that you shouldn't be doing and saying stuff you shouldn't be saying, but John, I'm just so glad that you tried, and you took your two or three steps, and you fell down, but there's Daddy right there to pick you up. That ain't just John today. That's all of us today. Come on, just say, Lord, I thank you've been right there to pick me up. Even those of us who've been walking with the Lord for a long time. Do you know that those of us who've been walking with the Lord for a long time, it's still the same for us? Because there's always some area in our life where we're like a little baby. Even for us being pastors in this area, it feels like being a little baby because this is all unfamiliar. This is all new for me and getting to know family members and stuff. So I'm in that sense, me and Carol are the same, taking little baby steps and we fall and we let daddy pick us right back up, get back out there again next week. <laughs> go and meet with the people of the Lord. Don't quit. No, you can't go back to St. Louis. Do this. You can do this. You can do this. We're in the same place. Thank you, Lord. Come on, rejoice today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.